All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first event of ACT's Spring 2015 lecture series towards civic art. I'm Gediminos Urbonas, director of the MIT program in art, culture, and technology. Uh, the Monday night lecture series was launched in 2005. The series aimed to bring together artists, cultural practitioners, and scientists from diver uh, different disciplines to discuss artistic methodologies and forms of inquiry at the intersection of art, architecture, science, and technology. This season's lecture series towards civic art investigates the critical spatial practices that claim manifold definitions of public art through a diverse array of visual forms argued by key practitioners across the disciplines of art, pedagogy, architecture, and urban studies to identify the tools, tactics, and consequences of actively reclaiming public space. The title towards civic art is borrowed from the Georgi Kepesh text published in 72 and alludes to the artists and cultural producers grappling convex systems when addressing crises of environment, politics, and democracy. Kepesh wrote, to quote, today artists like the rest of us face a profound crisis through brought by the increasingly dynamic complexity of our social fabric. Meeting its challenge requires their fundamental reorientation in order to probe, scan, discover, absorb, change, and re-edify their surroundings. They must transform themselves as well as the social framework of the creative process. Who better to begin this series with than Doris Sommer, founder and faculty director of the Harvard's Cultural Agents Initiative. Um, Doris is the Ira Jewel Williams Professor of the Romance Languages and Literatures and the director of the Graduate Studies in Spanish, Harvard University in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures. Calling attention to art as a social resource Sommer's recently published book, The Work of Art in the World, Civic Agency and the Public Humanities, takes inspiration from arts projects that merit more sustained reflection than they have gotten. Drawing on theorists including Kant, Schiller, Dewey, and Rancière, among others, Sommer argues that aesthetic training fosters judgment and so sustains civic life in democracies. Cases Professor Sommer considers include Antanas Motskus in Bogota, Edi Rama in Tirana, Albania, Augusto Boal in Brazil, and the world. Quoting from London Sky. <laughs> and in Lithuania. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Harvard's cultural agents is the interface between academic learning and civic engagement. The initiative promotes the divergent thinking of arts and humanities in the service of solutions to real life problems. In courses, conferences, and community-based projects, cultural agents joins a range of creative collaborators to feature art and interpretation as integral to active citizenship. Art is a force that drives innovation in everything from education, medicine, science, law, political leadership, and business. With a long humanistic tradition dedicated to civic development and thanks to contemporary mentors who show how the challenges of scarcity, violence, and disease respond to creative interventions, cultural agents links resourcefulness with service. Please join me in welcoming Doris Sommer. I, I want to thank so much Gedi Minas for this invitation. You are an ideal group of interlocutors. Um, you're not an audience. You're people I want to talk to together and individually. Uh, when I talk to colleagues at Harvard, uh, humanists think that um, we don't need to engage in the world. It's a way of selling our souls. Anything that sounds instrumental is anathema. When I talk to people outside of the humanities, uh, anything that is called art seems, uh, you know, decorative um, and irrelevant. Uh, 
so being here is uh, a wonderful opportunity, a privilege uh, to be with interlocutors. So thank you again so much for this honor. And um, I want to say about the humanities that we have a very long tradition, at least from Cicero on, of being civically engaged. Why did Cicero write his uh, most important speeches? For example, to defend um, his Greek teacher against the Roman courts. The Roman courts were about to, uh, to sacrifice this man just because he was Greek. And Cicero came out of his isolation, depressed isolation after his daughter died, and came to the Roman Forum and made his best speeches. That's the beginning of a tradition of civic engagement in the humanities. Maybe it's not even the beginning. What are Greek dramas about, if not uh, attempts uh, sometimes uncomfortable attempts to defend a, uh, a Greek democracy that was imploding on itself. The humanities, the interpretations of arts uh, have been civically engaged for at least 2,000 years and over the last two or three generations we have lost our way. Art has been interpreted for art's sake and anyone who questions that is considered a Philistine. So. The humanities have had a bad rap uh, among people who are engaged. And um, just to give you uh, an example of what that's done even in academic uh, publishing, when I presented a manuscript to Duke University Press uh, called The Work of Art in the World, uh, they said, why do you have this theory? Why do you have these theory chapters? I said, well, I'm an academic, I'm a humanist. They say, yeah, but nobody wants to read that stuff anymore. I said, well, then you don't want to publish a humanist anymore. Let's go to another press. And I actually had to argue the legitimacy of humanism with a good academic press. That's, that's how far we've gone and, uh, and lost our way. Um, on the one hand, as I say, practical people don't need humanists. On the other hand, humanists don't need to be practical. But the good news is that we're starting to suture that uh, divide um, in, in a couple of examples. And I, I want to tell you uh, a very recent example. It uh, is also from Bogota, Colombia, where some constitutional lawyers have contacted us because um, the inter-American courts have required American countries, and Colombia is the most important example of this now, to uh, give integral, comprehensive retributions to victims of armed conflict. Now, this is a country that has been in armed conflict for the last 60 years, and the courts have decided that it's victims from 1985 on who get comprehensive retributions. And the retributions come in five flavors. One is indemnization, money, political um, reparations, educational reparations, work reparations, labor reparations, and symbolic reparations. Well, the courts know what to do with the first four. They have no idea what to do with symbolic reparations. What's a symbolic reparation? So judges have been determining that this village or that city has to put up a bronze monument to victims of a massacre. And whether the people in that affected city want the bronze monument or not, the judges determine that the monument goes up. And since there's been some pushback uh, from the population, the uh, judges are asking for advice, and these constitutional lawyers are um, seeking out humanists for advice. So we're actually uh, working with them to develop um, a, uh, a range of responses for what symbolic reparations might be. And um, I have a feeling that even the other four categories of reparations will boil down to symbolic too, because uh, the Colombian government has made an option for, um, for victims to apply for reparations uh, alongside the court, not through the court system, which takes a long time and is very expensive, but there's a unit 
of, uh, of victims that will give very quick turnaround to cases. And there are already almost 8 million people who have signed up for that reparation. This is a country of 40 million people. The money is going to run out very quickly. So whatever little money gets, give, uh, gets uh, granted to victims is going to be symbolic. And I, I know about uh, the symbolic value of financial reparations because my parents got reparations from Germany. The, the, both of them were Holocaust survivors. And uh, a German institution called Wiedergutmachen, you know, to repair, uh, gives still to surviving um, Holocaust survivors um, monthly reparations in very small amounts, and these become symbolic as well. So it, it's, it's an opportunity to think about what symbols are, how uh, affected uh, victims uh, develop symbols um, and rituals, not only things. Um, Bogota is an especially rich place to think of symbolic uh, work to repair society. And uh, Gediminas already mentioned Bogota. How many people know something about the history of Bogota, Colombia? A few people? Um, are you from Colombia? Yeah? You're from, from Bogota? So, how, did, so did, you, did you live through the 90s there? OK, so do you, do you want to uh, just share with people in a, in a kind of uh, immediate way what, what the change was in the middle of the 90s? This was, Bogota is a city uh, that was um, prohibited for American citizens and for European citizens as a travel destination. Uh, those of us who are old enough remember signs in all of the international airports that said, don't go to Bogota. There, it was the only city that was off limits, right? And do you want to just stand up and tell people what happened? Yeah. Well, I was around 10, 12 years old. I was born in 86. So what I remember that it was very limited to go out the streets. Uh, there was a lot of conflict between the cartel and the government. And Does everyone hear? Please stand up and tell people, or take a uh, microphone. So, um, conflict between uh, cartel. Yes, uh, hi. <laughs> 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 so, the 90s in Bogota were tense. Um, there was conflict between uh, Cartel de Medellin, Cartel de Cali and they wanted to send them to the state. So there was a lot of urban uh, bombing. Um, yeah, cities were very chaotic. There was a, yeah, toque de queda, how do you say that? Curfew. Curfew and uh, energy savings all the time. And uh, yeah. And, and if you didn't have bodyguards, did you go to school? Yes, of course. You went to school. There were a lot of kids who didn't go to school if they didn't have bodyguards. And, and, and families who could uh, afford to leave Bogota sometimes made a decision. Yeah, a lot of people left. Too. A lot of people left, OK. So what happened that changed the city? A desperate city elected a very unlikely mayor. This was the uh, former president of the uh, National University, a nerd a philosopher, a mathematician, who lost his job in a very funny way because he tried to quiet um, students who wouldn't let him talk at the opening of the art school, actually, at the National University. And he refused to be quieted by rebellious students. Refused. Nothing worked to, to silence them. So he actually turned around and mooned them. He dropped his pants and mooned them. And he was very pleased with himself because everybody was quiet. <laughs> and he continued to give his speech until he got home and he saw his own behind on the TV screen because somebody had filmed him. <laughs> so he lost his job and he was available. And people elected this man, this is a conservative city, elected this man mayor of a major city which was in chaos because this was a desperate move by a desperate city. For a month, Mokus didn't know what to do. He wanted to make some difference. 
let's say, in traffic deaths because he wasn't yet going to go after the cartels. He wanted to tell the city, change is possible. Yes, you can. Si se puede. What was he going to do to reduce traffic deaths? He asked people for a whole month, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Nobody came up with a good idea. And finally, he asked the Secretary of Culture again and again and again. And, and Paul Brumberg, the Secretary of Culture, said, you know, Marcus, I, I asked my nasty old father-in-law. And um, he said, nothing to be done, kid. It's time to bring out the clowns. Well, Mokus could have been offended, but he looked at the guy and said, you know, that's a good idea. So he fired 20 traffic police from the center of the city, corrupt like everybody else, and hired 20 pantomime artists to direct traffic with no authority, none. They couldn't give tickets, they couldn't lock anybody up, but they could make people laugh at infractions. So here's, here's a picture. The little pink sign says incorrect in front of the bus. Um, and here's, here's a little uh, video of, of, of that moment. Yo recuerdo que las, cuando él empezó, uh, inventó los mimos, la prensa se reía de antaño. De estos largos y oscuros túneles ubicados bajo el centro de Bogotá, se preparan 20 jóvenes que pretenden enseñarles a los habitantes de la ciudad cómo vivir civilizadamente en una capital. Es a través del arte, ¿sí? a través de nuestra postura de, de, de la estética y de la ética, vamos a poner en servicio nuestro trabajo para dar educación ciudadana. Creo que la disposición a dejarse corregir es el complemento que espero frente a los mismos. O sea, los mismos solos no bastan. Ahora necesitamos que la gente acepte al mismo. Y es sumamente interesante ver cómo poco a poco, poco a poco, va calando la idea, porque es una idea que no se basa exclusivamente en el show. Personas que... Hasta el día anterior no, no, no lo respetaban. Okay, uh, I recommend if you're if you're interested in in seeing more. Um, go to YouTube and look for a film uh, made by a Danish uh, filmmaker whose name I don't remember right now. It's called Bogota Change, and it's in seven parts. You can just see it right there on your screen, Bogota Change. I think uh, the mimes are on the second uh, installment. Here's another art project, um, because the mimes were the icebreaker. And then Antanas, who says to himself, when I get stuck, I ask myself, what would an artist do? Antanas became a magnet for proposals by other artists in the city. And one very young man uh, in his early 20s came up with this idea. Uh, it was to paint um, black uh, fleeting stars that look like crosses in, in black and yellow, as if they were um, police cordons, uh, everywhere in Bogota where uh, there was a traffic death. I don't know if you remember seeing these, these stars. There were streets with one star overlaid on another. There were many, many traffic deaths just because people didn't care about each other. Uh, in the first year, traffic deaths were reduced by 50%, by 50%. And because he's a statistician, he was very careful about this. Uh, homicides after, uh, after two administrations, which spanned 10 years because there was a lapse of a couple of years in the middle, but after 10 years, homicides were reduced almost 70%. 
income to the city through taxes were increased threefold, 300%. Why? Because this man was incapable of stealing and because he cajoled people into paying even more than they owed the city. So here are people who hadn't paid taxes in years because the city was so corrupt, giving the city an extra 10% because he made a project called 110% for Bogota and 46,000 um, families paid in excess of what they owed the first year, and it grew, all right? Amazing, he cajoled people, he charmed people. Uh, this is, um, here's, here's another uh, project that an artist pre presented to him. Mocos, be super civico, be, you know, super citizen. So he wore this outfit to work for a few days until a woman stopped him on the street and said, Mayor, you got to get more serious, you know? So he, he stopped. But he was available both for proposals and for criticism. Nothing, nothing uh, was solid, but what was solid was the, um, the approach of fail better, you know? Of try, fail, and fail better uh, that, uh, that he knows from artists. So Mokus is one case. Uh, sometimes I talk with uh, city leaders or political leaders in general, and they say, we admire Mokus. He's a genius, but we're not Mokus. So we have to go do our work in more conventional ways. Of course, Mokus depended on a whole population of artists. Uh, and there are cities, even, even in the United States, that, uh, that have artist residencies. Um, as incubators for, uh, for good ideas. Yedimiras and I were talking about this. Maybe Boston will be such a city, but certainly Portland is such a city now, and Seattle is such a city, and Philadelphia is coming close to being such a city. So this is a kind of career path that we might want to develop with interlocutors. You need an artist to come up with ideas, uh, to convene other artists, to see how to, um, intervene in a traffic problem, in a drug-related problem. Um, you, you know the case of Edi Rama? You don't know Edi Rama? Okay. Here's, here's another artist that you can take pride in. Say, when people ask you, what is art good for? You say, please, let's be serious. Art is good for everything. Edi Rama um, was the mayor for three terms of the capital of Albania. Um, which is called Tirana, unforgettable, tyrant. <laughs> Tirana, Albania was a devastated city after years of Soviet neglect and then a decade of uh, mafioso uh, trading and, and uh, irregular building and polluting the river and um, just destruction. It was a city that was gray in spirit and, uh, and visually. Edi Rama came home in uh, 2000 to his father's funeral and his friends convinced him to run for mayor. This was a painter who lived in Paris very well, was quite successful, and had done with Albania. He didn't want anything to do with it. But they convinced him to run for mayor and he won. He won. What was he gonna do in a devastated city? Here is a painter in a city worth no money and with lots of crooks. What he did was use his own pocket money to buy big buckets of paint, very loud colors, tropical colors. And he got neighbors of um, old style Soviet tenements to paint the facades in designs that he proposed to them. They painted the city. In fact, Gediminas and I uh, imagined and then realized the plan to get Mokus and Rama together to speak at Harvard uh, about four years ago, five years ago, because we were standing in front of, of his apartment um, when I said, where do you live? He says, oh, these old uh, Soviet-looking uh, apartments. I said, oh, you should get Edi Rama to come propose something. He said, I know Edi Rama. I said, I said, where is your name from? He said, Lithuania. I said, oh, I know Mokus. <laughs> Mokus is from a Lithuanian family. So we, we got them together and, um, 
And it was the first time that at the Kennedy School for Government, uh, professors of government were saying, we always say that politics is an art, but we haven't taken it seriously until today. So again, this is a career path that I think um, we uh, can and should develop. Um, here's a before and after. Because once Rama started getting people to paint their buildings and improve the streets, uh, the World Bank, the Soros Foundation came in and um, really invested in this model city of an ex-Soviet uh, blight. Here's an example of a facade that, that he designed. And the, he just took down the illegal constructions. Here's another cityscape. Um, by the way, uh, last year, he was elected prime minister. He's now, you know, the prime minister of Albania. And unfortunately, I have to say that his, uh, his faith in art making has ended. He thinks now he has to get serious. And because he is um, an artist who is not a collaborative artist, uh, he isn't in invoking or convening uh, other artists to collaborate with him. And so um, that's another lesson to be learned, uh, uh, a limitation. I want to show you um, a kind of uh, corollary uh, of what, what we can think of uh, as the work of art in the world. Um, one of our friends and collaborators is uh, a well-known Mexican artist uh, named um, Pedro Reyes. Pedro Reyes used to be absolutely dedicated to art for art's sake. He was worried that um, interventionist art, that collective art, uh, sacrificed aesthetic value, and he had nothing to do with it. But then he was inv uh, invited um, at the uh, Carpenter Center at Harvard to do a show, and he wanted to do a show about the future. And he got stuck. He said, I'm not sure I want to make people more depressed than they already are. And the future is so depressing. So we said, you've got to meet more people. And we, in, and we uh, introduced him to Mocus, and that changed his artistic practice. It changed his artistic practice. So this is a project called um, Palas por Pistolas, Shovels for Guns. Palas por Pistolas, also translated as Swords into Plowshares. All right? Because what, uh, what happened in this case is that Pedro Reyes got um, a commission to do a statue for a botanical garden in Culiacán, Mexico. Culiacán is about as violent as Ciudad Juárez, as any you know, very violent city in Mexico. And he said to the collector, you don't need another statue. What you need is a program. Let's do a buyback program of guns and make an art project from that. So the collector offered vouchers for guns. In three months, they collected 1,532 firearms. They weren't just guns. They were submachine guns. They were rifles. They were really horrific arms. What do you do with a big pile of guns like that? You have to give them to the army. And Pedro Reyes, who did not want to dirty his hands with community work, with social anything, with engagement, negotiated not only with the collector to give vouchers, he then negotiated with the Mexican army to separate the wood from the metal and sell the metal to trooper shovel factories. And they made as many shovels as there were guns and are planting as many trees. And we did a planting uh, at the Harvard Arboretum. Now, Reyes then became uh, visible to the Mexican army and to the government as someone who knows what to do with decommissioned guns. So they, st they started just dumping all of these guns on him, and he came up with another project. It's called Disarm. He makes musical instruments from decommissioned guns, and they play music. He does concerts with them, and they're very beautiful, and they sound good. 
I don't know if uh, we, we don't have any more um, pictures. That's it. That's it. But um, I think I'll leave, uh, I'll leave this violin uh, on. Um, now, this, you like it, huh? I, if you look up disarm, Pedro Reyes disarm, you will see xylophones, you will see cellos, you will see uh, the whole range of musical instruments. Neil, I invite you <laughs> to, to think about this. Uh, but um, it's these kinds of cases that, uh, that interested Duke University. What they weren't sure about was the theory, but I, I, what I want to add here is what we can do with, um, with some thinking about humanism and, uh, and Gediminas uh, already um, mentioned this. I'll, I'll just develop it for a little bit and then open up for discussion. Why is humanism an important bridge between art making and public life. It's because it's a pause to think about how we relate to one another and how to judge the effect that we have on one another. This is the project of aesthetics. Aesthetics is not about the uh, creating an effect of beauty. That's the way aesthetics is sometimes used, but if you follow uh, enlightened philosophy. If you follow uh, Immanuel Kant, who's the, uh, the, the coiner of, uh, of the way we use aesthetics in philosophy, aesthetics is a secondary moment after the pleasant effect, the pleasant and confusing effect of art, because art is new and art confuses us, but it delights us. Because we're confused, we pause and we say, what happened? Was it really uh, a, a pleasure because it's beautiful? Or was it a pleasure because it reminded me of somebody or because I think I can sell it or because I feel moral since I like it? If it has any reason for pleasing me, it wasn't a real aesthetic effect. The aesthetic effect is disinterested. And we need a pause to really measure why we responded. The pause and the measuring is training for our sense of judgment. And this is why Immanuel Kant, who was not interested in art, wrote a whole book about aesthetics. Here's the Enlightenment project. It's to make us free, right? It's to make us free. How do we become free? We develop reason, but we also have to develop judgment. Because if you only develop reason, and this was the problem of the French Revolution, according to Kant and to Schiller and to uh, other people who worked with Kant. If you only develop reason, can you be free? If it's, if it's reasonable to add two and two and get four, are you free to make another choice? Reason has a track. Pure reason is a scientific concept, and there are correct and incorrect ways to think about the world. Practical reason is about morality, social laws, religion, but it's also a track. You're not really free when you're reasonable. Where do you get freedom? Where do you need freedom? It's when you judge. And judgment is different from reason. He says that again and again and again in the third critique. How do you develop that innate faculty of judgment? We don't need judgment if we're in an authoritarian state. We don't need judgment if we are in a strong Catholic church or if we are subjects of a monarchy. So the, the, the faculty had atrophied before the Enlightenment. How do you recover it? Well, Kant says you recover it by using judgment around things that don't matter to you, that have no interest for you, you right? You can't judge something that's gonna make you rich or famous or healthy or good, because then you're just reasonable. You know it's gonna make you rich. How free are you? You know it's gonna make you famous. 
You know what's going to make you healthy. Where do you have to judge? Where are you excited enough to want to think about something where you have no interest in it? Where? Art. Art. For him, it was beauty in general, because he didn't know from art, right? But he was looking at roses. He was looking at sunsets. And he says, when beauty arrests you, you don't know why. And you have to think about it. And you have to think about it so much, and you're so confused and delighted that you also want to talk to somebody and say, what do you think? Did that grab you? And I'm reading him now through Hannah Arendt. It's in that lateral relationship that you start to establish a free society because aesthetics is about subjective relationship to the world. But the subjective immediately becomes intersubjective because you're abuzz and confused and you want to talk to people and you want to see if you can get to the same judgment. So Kant, in a very cagey way, resignifies what common sense is and instead of making it a thoughtless adoption of what everybody knows, he resignifies common sense to mean the sense that we have in common. It's always intersubjective. So the basis of free civil society for Kant is the intersubjectivity that you get from aesthetic judgment. That's why it's important. That's why humanism has a role to uh, be an interlocutor with uh, artists, with, uh, with policy makers, uh, because this um, civic obligation to use judgment, to talk to other people, to develop um, common sense uh, is, is part of, uh, of humanism. And I'll, I'll stop here, but I uh, just want to say that it's Schiller who made a step beyond Kant and said aesthetics is about judgment, but also judgment in the process of making things. And if it weren't for Schiller using judgment while he made things, uh, somebody like Jürgen Habermas wouldn't have a clue about how to create agreement uh, among people who have very different sensibilities and very different values in the world. Habermas's uh, politics of communicative action is based on this aesthetic tradition. So um, I'll just stop here and, uh, and really invite you to, uh, to talk, to talk about your own experiences, to talk about aesthetics, about what you, uh, what you want to develop in your own work. And thank you very much for your attention. When you talked about aesthetics, the one image that came to my mind, and I want to drop names or places, there's a statue in Prague uh, devoted to, to Kafka. It's a, an empty suit, essentially, sitting on a chair. And on the empty suit's left shoulder is a fully dressed miniature human being. Whoever did this, I have no idea who the artist is, to me, was able to distill a lot of what Kafka is about. To me, also, this had nothing to do with aesthetics. What it had to do with was, um, I'm going to say, with the core sense of what Kafka's writings are all about. <clears throat> I wouldn't call it beautiful, necessarily. I wouldn't call it unbeautiful. It is what it is. And so maybe, r for me at least, rather than aesthetics, it comes down to, um, <laughs> how do I put the social awareness on the part of the artist or literary or something. But, it, but aesthetics, is, it, it, seemed to me, it seems to me to be a word that is so abstracted uh, that I have difficulty, uh, you know, latching onto it as a way of evaluating pretty much anything. Um, the judgment is immediate. Uh, it's inchoate. It's a whole bunch of things, but it's not according to a theory um, of however you want to define aesthetics. So I guess that's not more of a statement than a question, but why don't we turn it into a question? Okay, no, I, I turn it into a challenge. Okay, why don't we do that? All right. Um, what I want to say is that there was something about that statue that grabbed you. That's right.
part of the aesthetic effect is surprise. If it's not surprising, if it, if, if it doesn't delight you and make you think, and make you think, well, does that work or doesn't it work? Then it's too conventional, then it already has a message. It doesn't grab you. To be grabbed, you need to have a surprising, indirect uh, experience. Schiller is very clear about art being indirect. When he writes his uh, letters on the aesthetic education of man, he is responding to the French Revolution, to the terror of the French Revolution. And he says, the problem with the French revolutionaries is that they think they're going to achieve political freedom head on. Well, we don't have political freedom. We don't know what it is. So how do you achieve it head on? The only way to achieve anything is indirectly. And that's why art is important. If there were a clear message that were known before you saw that, that statue, the statue wouldn't have had the impact that it had. It has an impact because it's surprising. There's an empty suit and a little person on the shoulder. Are you not curious whether someone else responds to the statue in the same way? I'm not. It, You're not. It, to me, I, I, I mean, I, I, I give that privilege to each person who, who is responding to it. Maybe someday I'll run into someone who also saw it, and I'd like to hear, what did you think, man? I just, I think whoever did that got it. That's what I thought. What did you think? And you know, and go from there. But but yeah. beyond that, uh, I okay. don't think we need to have a conference about it. I think okay. I think it is a series of individual reactions to individual pieces, and we go from there and right. but, see what but happens. But that's the point. We go from there, and, and, uh, and the, the, the point about aesthetics is that it's always subjective, but at least the hope in enlightened philosophy is that it will lead to an intersubjective uh, c communication. And it's in the intersubjectivity that you achieve a kind of uh, new objectivity. If, if it's only your experience, how does it become social? Just in a serial way? Um, now, let, let, let's, let's leave it. We'll have a, we'll have a conversation. But, but the, again, the hope is that it, it will lead to you know, a nudging of someone else and say, huh, pretty good, or whatever. But it, it, it leads to something. I think my question's related. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the move you described from Pedro wanting to, or being interested in aesthetics for aesthetic's sake, to whatever form of judgment he uses to consider this valuable. And I'm wondering what you see as the relationship between those two types of judgment, how they're different or how they're related. If they, are they related on a spectrum? Or how, like, what, how do you characterize those judgments? No, I think, I think that uh, I wouldn't put them on the spectrum, but I would say that through Mokus, he was uh, won over to a possibility of making real art that was also an intervention. Not that his earlier art w didn't have an aesthetic value, but he, he appreciated the fact that even an interested art piece, indirectly you know, uh, conceived, could have uh, an aesthetic value. And, and he's a good student of art, so he, uh, he can access a tradition of Joseph Beuys, he can access other traditions here, um, and somehow make it work for his situation in Mexico uh, at that moment. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that there's a greater aesthetic uh, value to his later work but that it has an aesthetic value where he was skeptical that it might before he met Mokus. Does that respond to your question? Somewhat, I'm still chewing on it. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm not sure I have a very important point to make uh, just uh, 
I'm interested in the notion of surprise because I agree that that's, um, it's so important. You're saying that without it, something is a conventional action and gets a conventional response. What I want to say about surprise from my experience writing about art for a very lowbrow arts magazine for a very general audience is I'm simply trying to lead people to a place where they're not afraid because I think people are afraid of surprise right. and they're afraid of their own individual response and they may be afraid of their own emotionality which can come out without boundaries or right. limits. No, I think it's it's uh, really worth really worth staying with as uh, as an issue because art is about taking risks, right? And viewing art participates in that risk taking. We, you know, when we make ourselves available to see or hear or experience art, it's because we're available for the surprise. And if we're not, uh, we stay with fear. But but. The surprise sometimes activates our fear, and then we have to work through it. Kant has half of his book on aesthetics dedicated to the sublime. Beauty is one way of talking about aesthetics. The sublime is scary. It's disgusting or scary. It's something that you don't like, right? And I think it's a very important uh, factor when we talk about art, especially today, because when we live in multicultural societies, there's a lot around us that simply scares us or disgusts us. Civilized people, Kant would say, work through that first impulse and say, oh, I survived that surprise. That wasn't so bad. In fact, that was interesting. And. Um, I think a, 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 good pre, um, a good theorist of, uh, of the sublime is Roland Barthes in The Pleasure of the Text. I don't know if that's a, uh, a book that, uh, that people in, um, in other art forms uh, read, but The Pleasure of the Text is all about how good writers punish you. They tease you. They never give you what they say they're going to give you. And it's the, it's the, uh, the tension and the, um, and, and the punishment that you actually enjoy much more than the pleasant, you know, delivery. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's conventional to say that art is about something new, that it's uh, risk-taking, et cetera. But to say in very simple terms uh, it produces surprise is, I think, um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you picked that up because it's an easy way of, of talking to people who aren't necessarily experts uh, about what art um, does. Yeah. Mm, uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a question regarding um, the framework that, or actually it's related to Kant, um, who for many reasons is a deep controversial figure as well. Um, and when you speak about the sublime, um, I suppose there are if we consider it outside of the sphere in which he was uh, living in, and thinking, um, the sublime or the surprise or the aesthetic is for many other non-European cultures entry point to quite interesting um, experiential realms and cosmologies that were not available to someone like, like Kant who committed many mistakes and right injustices to a lot of constituencies, not only even within his own sphere. So I was just wondering, if your claim is, if I understand you correctly, is that through the aesthetic we can reclaim the political. Apparent, uh, particularly in, in, a, in, a, in a time where so many of, so much about our world is so f forcefully mutating into something that we cannot recognize or control. Like I, I think, you know, yeah, in terms of climate change and all these things that are so beyond uh, what we can comprehend. Um, wouldn't it be fruitful to consider alternative aesthetics uh, as entry points to sort of reclaiming that world or the commons uh, that crosses cultures, um, biases of? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, all all vehicles are are welcome. What uh, what I'm simply because of my limitations. 
I'm uh, trying to recover what looks like a standard line in, uh, in Western thought that we've lost. And I'm, I'm trying to recover it through uh, also the political results of it in a Habermas. I mean, Habermas is an interesting character. OK, he's a Western philosopher. But he assumes that universals do not precede a conversation. That's an advance. He's a white male from Germany, but he has the decency to say that universals are constructed only through debate, which is an advance. Let's recognize that as one little piece of, uh, of a puzzle and add many others. You, you will have to add yours because you know we're all limited. But if we have this disposition to be surprised, to recognize our uh, confusion or even fear, and then work through that to hear the, the contribution, we're in a better place. It's humbling and enabling. OK? So I'm, I'm using Kant as a bridge, not as uh, an island. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you so much for your presentation. I had a question regarding where, your- Where are you? My, I, I'm back here. Oh, I, thank you. I really loved what you said about humanism as a pause to think about how we relate to one another. So as a humanist, do you see yourself as the pause? And second part to that question is, uh, maybe with a little bit of setup, the examples that you used in your presentation were very much about individuals that were enacting change through artistic movement. How do you see the role of an institution or a broader organization or collaboration in enacting change through art? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. The, 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 the pre-conversation that we had to this presentation, I was saying to get the Minas, we have to get the institutions involved here. You know, uh, One thing that we do with cultural agents is a teacher training program for K through 12. Uh, we want to do it more and more in Boston, but Boston schools are uh, reorganizing themselves, to put it in, in those terms. But we, we, we work a lot in Latin America, in Colombia and Mexico and Nicaragua and El Salvador and Chile. Uh, we can train teachers thanks to good models like these artists we're talking about, but, but uh, mostly Augusto Boal, if you, if you know theater, right? Uh, Michelle, Michelle and I played you know, with Augusto Boal to treat each other as facilitators of arts programs. So if you can train regular teachers without replacing them through you know, uh, Teach for America, which assumes that Smart kids are better than regular teachers. Treat regular teachers as uh, potential facilitators for arts programs. The way that Boal treated everyone as potential facilitators and spect actors, right? So we go into a school and train teachers to stop being authority figures and start facilitating arts projects around the academic work that they have to do. We call the project pre-texts, pre-texts, because a text becomes an excuse for doing a choreography, a play, a painting, a sculpture, whatever. And if the text is raw material for making something else, kids learn the text. They don't want to read that sonnet, and they don't want to read the chemistry lesson, and they don't want to read. But if they're going to make a choreography, they'll read it. And the teacher doesn't have to know enough to explain that chemistry lesson, because the kids will figure it out. So that's how we learn from Boal to try to affect institutions. But in general, we, we work a lot with, uh, with forum theater. Um, we want to work more and more with institutions. And I hereby recruit you to lead us uh, into more institutional work. Thank you. Yeah. The value of a collaborative process. And I was just going to point out, I, I'm not familiar with your example, but it's about theater, which is inherently collaborative. 
how do you solve that problem? And the visual arts have different manifestations and different individual styles. You, you're not going to solve I the problem. Solve Someone the problem. has to solve the problem. I mean, <laughs> it's, enough, it's enough that you, you know, identified uh, a challenge. This is a lesson that, that I learned from Mokus, that a lot of people learn from Mokus. You, you have a problem, you immediately flip it and treat it as an artistic challenge. Right? If you talk to, I, I, I tried this many times, if you talk to economists and political scientists and, and uh, other you know, professionals, um, and you say, what do you do in a city like Bogota? They say, Nothing to be done. They look at their toolbox, right? There's no solution, and they say there's no solution. Do you know artists who say nothing to be done? Or do they say things like, let me think about it? I'll figure something out. Or I'll talk to this person and that person. I'll get a little collective together. That's, you know? So I don't have to have a solution. Here I am, I made you ask a question, somebody will have a good answer. Or you'll figure it out. Hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, so um, I've always, I guess, been wondering about how when you use art for political purposes, there's always the danger of art being used um, succumb to power institutions, and how do you maintain art as this disinterested entity, and is it possible? Yeah. It's, it's a tightrope. It's a tightrope, but here's, here's something that I learned from collecting examples, and that's uh, another kind of justification for engaging the humanities as artists, right? Engaging, uh, because we have the time to collect examples and to, you know, just be researchers. We don't do anything else. Uh, and what I learned is that it's a numbers game. The difference between Edi Rama and Antanas Mokus is that Mokus opened himself up to make art with the entire city with a range of artists who wanted to work with him, with people on the streets, and Edi Rama was a one-man art project. When you have schemes that come out of one mind, they are authoritarian. They are, and, and when you have collaborative projects, they may not produce uh, the greatest aesthetic effects always, but they will produce some kind of intersubjectivity and conversation. So there's a difference between um, the aesthetic effect of an artwork, I mean, this is a little dicey, and I don't know if I've worked it out uh, to my own satisfaction. There's a uh, difference between the aesthetic effect of an artwork and aesthetics as a principle, because aesthetics as a principle is about the surprise that generates intersubjectivity. So maybe there are people who will get excited about a painting that most of us will find boring. But those people who get excited about it will have an aesthetic experience because they'll want to talk to each other about it. So, you know, what's the difference between kitsch and art? Uh, it depends on who's looking at it. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a numbers game. Hitler was a great artist. Hitler was a great artist. <coughs> How did he define that? He staged fabulous newsreels where he was the hero. He staged battles so that he would be the hero of the movie. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great movie called Our Hitler by um, uh, Zilberberg. Zilberberg, right, Wh which really explores this, um, this creative, uh, you know, maniacal creative bent in, um, in Hitler. So that's, <clears throat> that's one way of answering your question. But the other way is, is, again, just to remember Schiller's notion of indirectness, which can be, you know, coercive, uh, but it's about 
trial and error and about getting people to think about what they're doing, not just focus on the results. Art has to be indirect uh, and open to interpretation. So, I think, yes, Rob. Um, I'm curious about the lasting impact of, um, in Bogota, the lasting impact of Pedro Reyes, uh, the lasting impact, for that matter, of the uh, mayor who then became prime minister of Albania. Uh, are these one-off shots, or was, in fact, something embedded in the society uh, after, I wish I could remember his name, by now I should know it, one, uh, the, the gentleman in, in Bogota, uh, after his efforts with the mimes and, and everything else, <coughs> what ultimately changed in Bogota over the long term? Well, we have uh, informants here. You know, Bogota goes up and down, but it's not the, um, it, it, it's not the, most dangerous place on the planet anymore. What happened in Bogota was that people began to um, revive a sense of optimism, a sense of things can be done. And even when things go badly, you know that you have the opportunity and the obligation to figure it out because nothing is impossible. So that's the lasting effect. You know, art has a shelf life, especially performing arts. It has a shelf life. You, you see a mime for two years and you get bored with the mime and it's, it's no longer effective. So you figure out another arts project for the streets. People who think that, they're, you know, that uh, a particular art project is a magic bullet uh, really aren't participating in, in the spirit of renovation and of surprise. So what works in Bogota is that there are a whole series of artists that come up with new ideas and teachers who come up with new ideas and police who come up with new ideas. Um, that's what works. I mean, I, I think there are a lot of public officials who think that when an art project goes stale, it means that it hasn't worked, rather than this is, you know, a renewing cycle. Come up with something new. What? Has to have been seen and used to have gone stale. So it's it, exactly, it's a, it's a good sign, right? And um, yeah, I was thinking a little bit about what a few people talked about. Which one? Which was um, how is it that we can reconcile aesthetics for its own sake, art for its own sake, which is crucial to a sort of freedom. Um, for the artist to experiment, not to be constrained by any sort of use value for the objects that they're creating, and um, an obligation to address serious civic problems. Um, so how do those two things function together? And I think the, the idea of directness and indirectness being um, put up against one another is, is the really sort of crucial turning point, right? Because the, right. the indirectness is about um, context-based process practices. So if you, you know, go about something indirectly or allowing the environment to influence what, what it is that you do, and that's exactly how intractable problems are then solved because the context is the solution that's um, digested as the work is created. Um, and uh, that, that thought was sort of um, sparked by the woman with the bow in her hair, who I, I like that, I, that question of, is it a spectrum? Because I think, um, in a way, it's not a spectrum, but it's a uh, dialectic um, between open-endedness and the um, ability to do things that are very useless and uh, doing but something useful. Yeah, but here, if, if something is apparently useless, but it makes people talk to each other, then it's not actually useless. Yeah. Yeah. That's Kant's point. And it almost has to be useless to be able to talk to each other across class and gender and age lines. Because if it were useful, then you'd have a different use for it than me. 
But if it's useless, if it's a, if it, you know, we're, we're looking at a rainbow. And we're both just staring at it. And we say, wow. But we recognize each other looking at it. So it almost has to be useless to be politically useful in this kind of basic way. Um, another thing that I didn't say about Schiller, but that you just reminded me of, is that the freedom of making art and the freedom that we have to retain, because we're all artists, that was one of his points. We all have a drive to make art. We have a spieltrieb, a drive to make art. Uh, is the freedom to make mistakes, to get something wrong, to be off the reasonable track, to try to make errors. He says that's why modern art is superior to classical art, according to Schiller because it's about uh, getting stale. It's about making mistakes. I have the freedom to do it wrong. Poor Goethe, he's such a genius that nothing goes wrong for him, so he's not free. That's the way he de dealt with his jealousy. <laughs> That's the way he dealt with his jealousy. But, but, but he makes a very cool point. He says freedom is about getting it wrong. <laughs> I wanted to respond to your point about uh, being free as an artist and how I don't know if artists have ever really been free in the entire history of making art because we always have these influences and we have sponsors and we have obligations and and now I think we're coming into this time intellectually where it's much more possible but there are still insurmountable pieces of freedom that you know we're never going to be able to quite get over in terms of social justice in terms of access to making art and uh, that's something as an art educator, as an art historian that I've tried to battle with in my own work, that there are plenty of populations in this country and across the world that just don't have access either okay. to the time or to the, the, the resources. Okay, what is freedom? And here, here I'm going to share with you another lesson that Mokos uh, taught me. He uh, taught me to think of freedom through rational choice theory. Only he could have done this, all right? He says, read John Elster on rational choice theory. He made me read this book called Ulysses Unbound, where Elster says that the only way to make a rational choice is to bind yourself more than you're already bound. All right? So if you lack freedom because you don't have the money or the time or whatever, Put more constraints on yourself, and that's when you'll make a rational choice. Your only freedom is to put more constraints on yourself. And so he lays that out in the first part of the book. It's theoretical. And then the next part of the book is all about cases of people who know how to create freedom by binding themselves more. And you know who those cases are about? All artists. It's just fascinating. He says, Think of a French novelist like Georges Perec, who writes an entire novel without the vowel E. Can you imagine writing French without an E? <laughs> he writes the whole novel without an E. Think about filmmakers today who decide to film in black and white. It's so easy to do color. But they bind themselves, take away color, to make uh, more constraints so that they can take a situation into their own hands. The only way to take a situation into your own hands is to limit yourself even more than you're already limited. So Antanas' uh, interpretation of this is, if you're a prisoner in um, a small cell, right, eight by eight cell, take your fingernail or chalk if you're privileged and have a piece of chalk and make it six by six. That's the way you get your freedom. So it's a, it's a, it's a spin. It's a spin, and uh, I'll, I'll give you another slogan that Mokus uses. He says, when I feel stuck, I ask myself, what would an artist do, right? And then he says, when that doesn't work, I say, reinterpret. <laughs> reinterpret, be a humanist, right? Give it a twist. Just don't make something, just give it a, a spin. And, uh, you know, how many wonderful uh, art projects do we know about of people who have very limited resources and time? What's African-American music about? What's recycling about, you know? It's a different spin. 
I have an interlocutor here. Oh, good. Uh, I just want to just want to share but, an example yeah. of yeah. what happens when you reinterpret. I just saw a, a reading, not exactly a production of Hamlet, which was called Reverse Hamlet, and uh, the women played male roles and the males played female roles. And my perception of it was a lot of it didn't make sense. And I liked that. <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interlocution and your attention. Do you, yeah? Do you, do you want to say? I would love to. These were all great. identifications, verifications. You're a woman, mostly men, one woman. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I didn't Go ahead, go ahead, no, 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 please. No, it's just, no, 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 it's okay. No, after, after you said women and men, and you, now you have to speak up. <laughs> uh, and I enjoyed your presentation very much, Thanks. and I uh, like how you dealt with the the many rainbow of issues that come across and are able to use determined viewing to look at judgments, identifications, and verifications, how we re-see, and what happens then. I like, I like that very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're not used to thinking about the success of an arts project through a statistical analysis of you know, homicide. But I, I actually think that's an interesting measure, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, thank you so, so much for your attention and your wonderful questions and comments. Thank you very much, Doris. Uh, well, I would like to, um, I would like to uh, thank Doris and, uh, and also everyone who was helping to, to uh, launch this lecture series and, uh, you know, first of all, Amanda Moore and all the stuff at ACT. And also to use this last minute, you know, uh, after I'm thanking, uh, also to announce the upcoming uh, events in the lecture series and few other events that we're organizing at ACT these coming weeks. Uh, so this Wednesday, uh, so we kind of like a little bit violating the regimes here, right? A little bit. So this Wednesday, we're continuing with the Monday series of lectures, right? This, this Wednesday, March 4th. Uh, with Jana von Heiswick, uh, uh, who is artist coming from uh, Netherlands, and she is now a Kiev Haring Fellow uh, in Art and Activism at the Bart College. So she's coming on Wednesday night uh, with her lecture on her practice. Uh, and uh, coming Monday, March 9th, we have Donna Petrescu and Konstantin Petko, um, architecture platform called Architecture Auto. Uh, Atelier Architecture Autogere from Paris. Uh, uh, they're giving lecture on March 9th, coming Monday. Uh, just to give also to share with you some information on the coming events. Uh, this Friday, March 6th, from 7 to 9 p.m. at ACT Cube, we have MIT visiting scholar and art sound artist Arnold Dreiblatt, who will be holding a public lecture entitled From the Archives Installation and Performance 1990 and 2015. Uh, I'm also pleased to announce that Azra Akshami, MIT ACT assistant professor, along with MIT ACT students, affiliates, and staff, will be participating as part of the Culture Runners edition uh, for the Armory Show Special Projects from March 5 to March 8, Pier 94 in New York City. So if any one of you are uh, going to New York, please you know, you're welcome to visit uh, the Culture Runners Project uh, along as you uh, visiting other projects at Armory Show, right? Um, Azrak Shamia and ACT alumni Matthew Matsota will also participate in the panel Culture Runners Journeys and Collaborations presented by R. Jamil and Edge of Arabia as part of the Armory Show Open Forum on Friday, March 6. Um, so, yeah, check it out, what's happening in New York this weekend. And for more information about the lecture series in ACT, visit our site, uh, which is act.mit.edu. Thank you very much for staying with us tonight, and I'm looking forward to see you in the coming events. Thank you. <laughs>